everyone, and welcome to a special edition of On an Island. We have a lot to get through today, a range of topics, questions sent in from Lakers around the campus. Lakers everywhere want to know more about our guest, Yale Headmaster, Mr. Chris Post. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Post. How Thanks are you? Thanks for today? having me. I'm good. I'm good. Good. We are excited to have you here today. I'm excited to be here on an island surrounded by the lake. Get it? Lake, yeah. island, <laughs> trying. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Ah, great question. I was born in Buffalo, New York. A lot of snow. A lot of snow, but not in August when I was born, surprisingly, I'm sure. Uh, I lived there until I was about four, and, uh, and my family moved to outside the Boston area where my mom and dad both had new jobs, and that's where I grew up, and my family uh, lives there still today. What was your childhood like? Oh, boy. Uh, it was a great childhood. Uh, I'm the oldest of three siblings. Uh, I have a younger sister. She's four years younger than me and a brother who's 11 years younger than me. Mom and dad both worked uh, in Boston. Mom was a doctor. My dad was a professor at Boston University. I spent a lot of time rooting for the Red Sox and watching them lose. A lot of time watching the Patriots lose as well. But uh, in my early adulthood and, and older adulthood, I've been um, I've been blessed with more championships more recently. So, Tom Brady. Tom Brady. So uh, I, I went to a great all-boys school um, when I was a young man. Started, the school uh, began in seventh grade, and that's when I started there um, and had a great, a great experience. And in a lot of ways, um, that school reminds me of Boys Latin, and Boys Latin reminds me of that school. And, and that's a part of the full circle of, of how and why I'm here today. That's, that's perfect. Did you play any sports growing up? Not particularly well, but I did. Um, <clears throat> so I had one terrible season when I was eight years old playing soccer. Um, I did manage to score a goal. It was on my own team. Um, I played when I was at Rivers, my, my school. I played football. I wrestled, uh, and I played baseball. How do you think those sports, playing those sports growing up, shaped who you are today? So, um, you know, one of the things, uh, it's hard to believe, but, but I was not necessarily the most talented student athlete. Um, but I had a chance to be with my friends and on teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned a lot about uh, success and more about failure uh, and how to get up yeah. from, from failures um, and the lessons of hard work and perseverance, I think, you know, helped me as I went on to college and life beyond that. Um, you know, uh, no day is as bad as you think it might be. Uh, the sun's always going to come up the yeah. next day. And, you know, um, there's a lot to be said for... Um, for taking your licks and getting back up. Yeah. So other than sports and playing soccer and all that, what did you guys do for fun? Uh, what did we do for fun? Well, Desi, we spent a lot of time in the library. We would read books and, and recite poetry to one another. No. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, look, I grew up in the 1980s, which, which was probably the greatest decade of the whole 20th century, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, just normal teenagers, right? So, you know, we were involved in a lot of student clubs and activities. Um, I was involved in, in the student leadership, student body officer. Um, we had, uh, you know, we had girls schools that were sister schools. And, and so we would do things like, you know, make sure that there were um, community service projects we shared together, dances and things like that. Um, and uh, I worked at a summer camp during the summers, which was awesome. Really? A uh, ton of fun. Yeah, so... I mean, my parents tell me all the time, how different was it without phones? Like, was it better? You think it was better? Oh, yeah, there's no question it was better. So, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, my friends and I um, were able to develop relationships, uh, you know, through just being together with one another. Um, and there weren't the kind of distractions that I think, you know, uh, you all face today. Yeah. And challenges, too, along with that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's great. I think it's also great that, like, the senior retreat, you don't have to take, you shouldn't take your phone on that. Yeah. I think it really builds, like, relationships. I, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I'll tell you, one of the things I worry about with, uh, for, for you and for your generation is that because of technology and how, you know, widespread it is, there's this constant um, wondering, like, what am I missing, right? Mm -hmm. or, or seeing something play out online that you think means one thing, mm -hmm. but it's not really at all. Right. Um, and and I, I do worry about that level of distraction um, for your generation. But I think, you know, things like the senior retreat are a really good way to learn how to um, how to be able to balance and hold 
those distractions in a way that's maybe a little bit healthier. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, what were your top three favorite subjects in school? Um, they were history, English, and history. You loved history? I loved history. I loved history. Um, and, and, you know, it's all about teachers. I had great history teachers um, who were inspirational to me. Um, and, in fact, that's, that's kind of my path is that um, one of those history teachers went to Johns Hopkins. Um, when I was looking at, at colleges and universities, um, there was a, a, you know, I grew up in Boston, a lot of push to stay up in the Northeast and go to some of the schools that were up there. And um, I wanted to do my own thing. And, and this one teacher uh, was a Hopkins grad and said that I should look at it. And um, I came down, fell in love, and, and the rest is history. See, see what I did there? Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I went to Hopkins. I studied history at Hopkins and, uh, again, just, just fell in love with the subject and, and, and the work. What made you love history so much? Because I, I love history. So, so I think, I mean, it's a couple things. One, it's the stories. It's stories of human resilience. It's the stories of, of human change. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? I think we have to be honest about what our experiences have been so that we can learn the lessons to not repeat them in the future. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, though the story of human resilience is, is amazing, um, I, I'm also fascinated by the parallels in history. So if you look at, so I studied when I was at Hopkins, I, I majored in um, largely in American history. Um, but then when I went to grad school, I thought I was going to major in American history, and I ended up doing essentially diplomatic history, right? So, so the history of how nations interacted with one another. Um, and so the parallels over times where you realize, you, you think that we all have these extraordinary differences that separate us. And in fact, we're a whole lot more similar than we give ourselves credit yeah. for. But, but the hard work, and I think this, these are the lessons of history, the hard work is to be able to sift through all of that to really get to our core essence. So. Yeah, I always feel I always feel like my history teachers are so they just love it. I've never seen someone love a subject so much. Like math teachers, maybe maybe they like it a little bit, or just teaching it. But history, like when when I'm learning history with Mr. Whitehair, he's into it, and he's getting he's getting like loud. Yeah. He's getting into it. There's some passion behind it, right? There's so much passion. So, so one of the things. So I'm in my 15th year as headmaster here now. You know that. Um, and and when I was a senior at Hopkins, um, so you knew I wa I, said I wanted to teach and everything else. There was, I had taken a class in the fall of my senior year, um, which was also attended, it was, a, it was, we called it the night school back then, it's now the graduate school of mm -hmm. education. Um, but it was a class that there was a guy who worked in the admissions office of Boys Latin, he was also in it. It was for his master's program. And so he and I got to talking and, uh, and he said, well, you know, if you wanna teach and coach, you really wanna do an internship. And what he meant was, you know, you graduate college and then you go off and, and you work at a school, kind of like the one that I ended up working at, but you might teach one class or two classes and you learn from some mentor teachers. Well, short, long story short, I ended up as an intern in Boys Latin's middle school in the spring of my senior year. So, you know, Mr. Curry, right? Yes, I do. So, so Mr. Curry, taught seventh grade geography, and he was one of my mentor teachers really? a long time ago. And so much of what I learned about um, having an influence in the life of boys and young men goes back to those experiences all those mm -hmm. years ago. The point here is that um, I'm passionate about history. We have folks on this campus who are passionate about English and science and math, but at the end of the day, what unites us all, we're not teaching subjects, we're teaching you, we're teaching boys, yeah. right? And, and I think that's the, that's the beauty of our school and that's you know, hopefully what differentiates us from so many other places. I was, I was gonna ask you what makes BL so different because you've taught, been a student at so many places, but you just answered the question. Yeah, I mean, so, so you know, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed that this is my 15th year and it's, it's hard to believe, right? It, it's yeah. like, it, it's only 15 years and like it's gone by in a minute, it seems like, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that, that has always uh, been clear, for, for me at least, is that we are just, we are firmly fixed on our mission, right? Our job as a school is to help you and all your classmates and all the guys in the middle school and, and the lower school understand what it means to live out our motto, Esse Quamadere, to be rather than to seem. Teaching you core values of courage, integrity, and compassion. And at the end of the day, the most important thing, 
building enduring personal relationships, right? The relationships you have with your teachers and with your coaches, with your, with your classmates. And it's in that that you learn how to strive to work really hard for academic and for personal excellence. None of us are perfect by any stretch, right? I've, I don't know, I've probably made a thousand mistakes already and it's not even noontime today, yeah. right? Um, but we're all striving for something bigger and greater. And that's the work of this school. And, and that just is part of everything we do. Do you find anything frustrating being the headmaster? Um, yeah, so, so I had a chance this morning to teach Mr. Hill's AP European history class. Because yeah. he, he's off with Mr. McDonald leading the Model UN yeah. group. Um, and, and I miss the classroom. I miss being able to get in there and, you know, mix it up on yeah. ideas. And, you know, you'll have to talk to those guys and see how I did. I, it was rusty, but I think I, I think I held my own. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's the path that I followed to get to the place that I am now. Um, but I know that my work is different, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's been a little do dusty and noisy and, you know, cold in the building this year with what's going yeah. on, right? And so I know that that's been challenging for people. So trying to be able to make sure that we acknowledge that, but also help folks see the bigger picture, right? You know, mm -hmm. for, um, for, for, you know, guys who are seniors, even there's some benefit from the construction and, and for everyone else who's coming behind, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fully renovated, brand new upper school, new yeah. addition, new gym, whole nine yards and, and being able to help the school make progress towards those goals that that's, uh, incredibly rewarding. So, I mean, talking about change, how has BL changed in nearly two decades since you've started? So, so asking me that question has made me feel really old in this moment when you said <laughs> two nearly two decades. decades. Holy cow. Um, so I remember um, interviewing to be headmaster here and, uh, and being asked about what the future might look like. So it was the fall of 2007. Um, and, you know, trying to, trying to describe, well, you know, we're a school of about 625 boys or, and, you know, I'm sure that things will change in the classroom and everything else. I could never have predicted um, just how the impact of things like technology, what's, what's that had on, on learning. Um, obviously, we as, as a school, as people, as a society, um, have experienced over the last couple of years in terms of the pandemic, you know, some, some real deep and meaningful challenges that I think as we're, as we're getting further past that, it also shows the incredible uh, spirit and resilience that we have and the way that we can, um, that we can adapt and change. So, um, so I remember in, in March of 2020, um, you know, we had just uh, decided we were gonna extend spring break by 10 days or something like that, right? Just yeah. take a little extra time. Yeah. And, um, and, and we were hiring, we were in the process of hiring some folks. And I remember interviewing someone by Zoom, and it was the first time I'd ever done that. And I was so uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And then I wanted to hire that person. But that person lived, you know, out of the area, and, mm -hmm. and you know, the world was shutting down, you know, bit by bit, more than bit by bit, chunk by chunk. And, um, and I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't, you know, look that person in the eye and shake their hand and, you know, kind of really understand who they were. Yeah. And now I won't think anything of hopping on Zoom yeah. later today. Um, I'm fortunate to have some relationships with, with folks who run schools all over the world. Um, and, and we, you know, about every six weeks or so, we jump on a Zoom over the weekend. So I've got a friend who runs a school in South Africa and a friend who runs a school in New Zealand and a friend who runs a school in Australia and a guy in the UK. And, and we'll hop on Zoom and we'll talk about you guys, right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done that the same way three years ago. And now, snap of, fingers. Snap of the fingers and, and there it is. Um, I think it also means for you and for your generation, you guys are going to be way more adaptable than old folks like me, right? You know, because yeah. because the world has has caused you to do that. So go back to what we were talking about earlier about phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. My hope is that you learn 
generationally how to balance that better than we adults have done. And that you can, you can, you can um, strike a better balance with, um, with knowing kind of the um, when to be on and how to be off, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. So, because yeah. I do think in terms of the relationships, um, I'm not worried about my generation and enduring personal relationships. I think we had, you know, lots of years of that. Um, I do worry about folks who have been isolated and, you know, through technology, what that's meant. That's a great answer. Thanks.